Welcome, Craig and friends. Welcome, Craig. Uh, today we're testing out a new microphone, and it's no longer attached to a headset, which means I should get less feedback from headset noises. That will probably be a side effect, too. So we're coming in loud and clear. Sounds like this this uh, Terry's Chocolate Orange is working. <laughs> the ever-evolving, I think it's called a snowball, the ever-evolving setup of amateur broadcasters. Yeah, it's a blue snowball, but it was packed like a Terry's chocolate orange. I fucking almost ate it. Oh, it, even like the packaging was folded over itself with a little crown? Yes. It it <laughs> was in, you know, because Terry's chocolate orange comes in, uh, it's like a three-sided plastic thing with two with the top side and the bottom side that kind of crowns over and under it and holds it in a cradle. It right. was exactly like that, but heavier. Yes, I would imagine so. Uh, one time in the 10th grade, my friend and I threw an orange under a library, like a, a, a one of the book racks in the library, and we came by at the end of the year to check it out, and it had turned completely into black dust. <laughs> Did somebody try to snort it? <laughs> no, that we didn't go that far. I don't think, I don't know if I would be sitting here to tell you the story of it today if that were the case. Oh, yeah, it just like black mold dust. I'm sure there's somebody out there. There's people out there who chew the light bulbs for the, whatever that shit's inside, right? So, so that somebody sniffing rotted orange dust. At at that point, it was probably more or less chemically inert. Yeah, true. It goes right through you. <laughs> it would probably come out both ends, but <laughs> I don't know if it would do much more than give you like a couple of hours of grief emotional like actual just grief just a darkness in your soul i mean then it wouldn't really be all that different from school <laughs> that's true it would just kind of be like all your school years all at once actually to make to make a little bit of a segue bottled darkness in your soul sounds like something that you could get from acme does it ever though bottled darkness they it's on the rack right next to the void juice sweet relief well, I've been I've been looking I'm looking at the uh, the Looney Tunes fandom and uh, the the wiki and scrolling through Acme products and so we've got dehydrated boulders, got one fifth bumblebees, <laughs> the do it yourself tornado kit. Torna <laughs> I like that one especially. The, that got... that one is outlawed in Alabama. Yeah, actually, right next to the do it yourself. Actually, this is actually probably part of it. I'm looking at two products, but this was probably part of the kit is 1000 tornado seeds. Just add water. <laughs> don't take them to Florida at the same time as a hurricane. <laughs> no, definitely don't. There's a little bit of water when that happens. They've got the jet propelled pogo stick. Oh, that one sounds really useful. That's where uh, Winona Ryder got her magic flying broom. Oh, earthquake pills. Do they just make you shake until the tectonic plates start to vibrate or what? Actually, you know what? That actually sounds very familiar. Can you envision in your mind Wile E. Coyote eating an earthquake pill and then rattling off the page? Like, all, it would be very similar to if somebody swallowed a jackhammer. Yeah, like a, an earthquake pill. It sounds like something that just causes you to quake. It's like yeah. a personalized earthquake. All the experience of an earthquake with none of the property damage. I mean, unless you vibrate into stuff and damage it yourself, that's you. Yeah, that's on you. That's part of the waiver that you sign. Yeah, you had a responsibility to do this in a place where you couldn't destroy everything. Acme surely has paperwork and waivers for everything. Oh, they must be like fully half of what they send you when you order a product is a whole bunch of waivers you have to sign before you actually get the real delivery. And that's why the delivery seems so fast. It is amazing that they deliver right to wherever you are. Albuquerque, Timbuktu, anywhere. Or yeah, wherever. Yeah, I don't know if it ever... Were they ever actually at Albuquerque? They were always somewhere that was not Albuquerque, but somewhere that you would get to if you made a wrong turn at Albuquerque. Yeah, uh, Albuquerque was always part of the journey, but never the destination. As it should be. As it should be. Sorry, anybody who's listening from Albuquerque, but I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't already know. Well, being that we <laughs> segued and then segued away from the segue, shall we discuss our topic for today? Oh, I would love to. What's our topic today, Todd? Today it is the Acme Killer and the fundamentals of the Acme Killer, which I, uh, I attempted to uh, assemble before we got in here, 
Oh, I'm glad that at least one of us came prepared. Well, we had we had a fair amount of of notes because we've kind of been discussing this topic for a while and then just kind of brushing it aside because of more compelling things came by. And so the idea of the Acme Killer is that somebody has been killing people with the Acme products from Looney Tunes. You heard it here first, folks. This is not our most compelling material. <laughs> no, this is this is our fourth pick. <laughs> this is what we start. This is the fat we skim off the top of the soup. <laughs> yeah. And well, I mean, look how long it took us to make a best man episode. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think that was almost two seasons later. Yeah, it was. It was how it was almost kind of halfway through the second season or whatever. Um, but my the the idea was that there somebody has been murdering is a serial killer who has been eliminating people by say a bot a, a body was found smashed to a pulp against a tunnel painted onto a, a road and obviously somebody g- ran or drove at the tunnel at a very fast speed and continued through it with magical roadrunner powers but this body was was smashed against the 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 cliffside this just in body found underneath a completely smashed grand piano that uh, also happens to have a massive safe dropped on top of it Oh yeah, that and the anvil because that is one of their actual products. Yeah, uh, yeah, and there's an anvil just stuck halfway through the safe. Acme detonator nearby. I'm looking through these again. Oh, naturally, there's a little detonator. Yeah, it's got to be just like this big curly wire, and it it goes on for like half a mile, and then there's just a little little you know the plunger. I guess some of the other ones that we did. Wait, what is this one? Is this a rock? The artificial rock. Ah. Well, what the hell is it then? It lets you become like a real rock out in the open. I think oh, somebody hid it's, behind it's it. It's like a to... disguise. It's like the tree. It's a yeah, fake exactly. bush. Yeah. So I do think somebody should be killed with the tornado kit. That's very funny. I think that's probably the funniest out of all of them that I can think of. Just like tornado seeds. Yeah. And yeah, you plant them and add water. There was an Acme water pistol that came with the kit as well. And here I always thought tornadoes grew from the sky down. Acme is teaching me science. Yeah, they grow up. Just like we never did. <laughs> True. There's some symbolism there. Oh, we do need to do the giant rubber band. Oh, is it is it used in conjunction with like a pair of uh, crappy wooden uh, wings and somebody's trying to fly? Oh, I thought somebody would have just been rubber banded into a wall. Oh, I mean, that's definitely possible. You can use a rubber band as a trap, but it's also useful for just like propelling yourself. It's almost like being a human cannon, but like even less safe. So this is well, here we need to develop a little the other half of the equation a little bit, because the idea that we were going to try to introduce into this was that the Roadrunner was not actually the Roadrunner this whole time. This serial killer is an individual who disguises himself as the Roadrunner. And Wiley e. Coyote is the adopted moniker of several investigators who've been on his trail, most of whom had died at the Roadrunner's hands. And it turns out that this whole time, the Roadrunner was Alec Baldwin. Yes, I, I do recall that uh, not only is this a murderer dressed as the Roadrunner, but the Roadrunner has been the killer the entire time. Since the beginning of the Roadrunner, since the dawn. Of the Roadrunner. Yeah, since the dawn of the Roadrunner, the Roadrunner was somebody else. Now, are are we actually going to suggest because like are we going to suggest that Alec are we gonna keep the part that Alec it's Alec Baldwin? I you know what I've decided we should maybe ease off of him and make fun of him next year. Okay. But you know, there's an entire world of acceptable targets out there. It could be That's Bill Cosby true. again. Oh, interesting. Because because we all, the way that we wanted to tie it back in with our kind of season theme a little bit was that Plato was going to turn. So we're going to discover there's this series of, of crimes, this series of uh, string of murders, and they're all tied together. And we somehow are going to say, wow, who is the villain here? And Plato would point out, well, the question you should be asking is, what is a villain? And then we get to explore villainy. and the spectrum from hero to villain and and where that little cutoff line is. 
So how do you think we should introduce that then? Should is Do Tucker and Todd ask that question? Is Columbo investigating this case and kind of telling us the details? And so we're curious or are we invested in it somehow and um, trying to solve it? I think that our, you know, our our time tested sort of strategy of never actually taking any initiative whatsoever for ourselves is one that should continue for a little while longer until we become limitless. So uh, either Columbo is investigating it, although he usually spends his time covering up crimes, so he could, be in, he could be involved in it in another way, or Stan happens to be talking to us about it because he's always reading newspapers and magazines on his favorite little couch. It could be Stan. If he's just kind of just discussing gossip, that would work. But I was also going to propose it could be the Fargo cops. They have something going on, a, a case. Or if we want to get creative with our little inside cast, uh, we are asking straight women to come hang out with us or go on an adventure or write something or whatever. And But she's dressed up as straight detective. She's all in black and white. And she's like, I can't. I got an actual case. I got to be straight detective this week. And we're like, ooh, tell us more. I like that so much better. I like that. That's much better than what I was thinking, which was that we were watching a stupid cartoon and the news immediately, because like breaking news totally took over the TV program we were watching and, and we were mad about it. And we were like, we're going to have to get to, bo to the bottom of this so that we can finish our TV show. Oh, we could we could still do that as a joke where we're and that could also be it's a little reference. It opens up on us watching cartoons. Uh, I like that where it's a little bit of a self-reference and then it goes from we're watching the cartoons and that gets cut off by the news, which the news was about to talk about the case. But we immediately shut it off because we're like, oh, news. And then we. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah, that's that's better than I should have known. The correct answer was both. <laughs> it is always both. But it's been, I think it's been a while since we've actually had a both situation. It has been a little while, but I think that works. And I, I do like that better. It like the news, it's like breaking news, blah, 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 something killer. Like it has to kind of just begin to hint at what the program is. And then we shut it off. We're like, ah, oh, news. And then, and then since our cartoon is ruined or whatever, we're like, let's go see what straight woman's doing. Cause we're bored. Yeah. We go to like bother her. Yeah. Well, I assume that's what we do to everybody we know, we just mostly bother them. Okay, so that's what a what a cute intro. That was a very smooth, seamless, lovely intro. I think I I I'd like it, and that was a that was a perfect example of collaborative writing. Yeah, putting the pieces together. Okay, so that is our transition. Uh, she okay, so she's all black and white, doing her noir thing. She has a case. At the, at, sorry, sorry, I have to interject. At the same time that all all the rest of the world is in color, she is somehow in black and white. Oh, yeah. That's super oh, important. I think, yeah, precisely. Actually, I've just been watching Upload on Amazon Prime, which is about like a reality in which before people die, they can put their consciousness into a uh, virtual reality. <laughs> in, a, in a thumb drive that gets put in a butt plug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Which I know is not the first time that that uh, kind of like concept has been spun around, but it's a Greg... Daniels, whatever his name is, the guy that did The Office and Parks and Recreation. It's oh, nice. uh, it's a him Amazon uh, comedy series, but it also is very dark and it kind of like it's a reality in which rich people can get unlimited data for three generations of their family. But if you can't afford it, you get like two gigs a month and, and your your dead body is stuck or well, not your dead body, but your uploaded consciousness is just kind of like stuck in a white room until the month rolls over and you have data again. And then some people can't afford to upload at all. Brutal. Also brutal that some people don't know how to manage their data properly, even in a matter like that. <laughs> right. When it becomes the actual metagame, you can't even. Like, it's literally your life now. That's that's what you get to experience. You can't, no, I'm going to blow through it all in the first week after the rollover. And now I have a white room and just like myself. And that, that was one of the holes that I was kind of curious about was one girl was like, just chill out. Don't think too hard. If you think about hard things, you're going to be using up your data. Just kind of like hang out. But it's like if you're just hanging out, staring at the wall, then why don't I use my data right away for something fun and then just be shut down for the month and then, okay, I'm black. 
that depends on whether you actually get to shut down or whether you are actually stuck there kind of perceiving your own empty consciousness. That was my question. They don't really answer that one. Because uh, if I could just like turn it off, f- uh, fuck data, I'd just turn it off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, that is an option. You can, there is, there is the torrent. Anybody well, there, can walk of, to of the course. torrent and jump into it. See, see, that's the thing is that option is roughly equivalent to never uploading yourself in the first place and just being dead. Yeah. Which is what I choose, obviously. Oh, and that's obviously also one of the emotional kind of like key points of, of, of the, the season or whatever is, is the, 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 the elder family members who don't believe in the uploading and just want to be dead and in heaven, like their, their other uh, ancestors or whatever, you know? Uh, no, if I have to go to heaven and continue existing, there's no deal. Put me in the computer and just turn me off then. <laughs> exactly. I don't want to exist forever. That sounds like an actual worst nightmare scenario. And I don't understand people who think it would be awesome to exist forever. Yeah, it. it I have never looked forward to that. <laughs> like, eventually I'm going to run out of new experiences and I'm going to just be bored. And if I can't even experience, like, if, if I can't even shut off the, the boredom, then I get to be bored for eternity. And that's worse than not existing at all. Groundhog Day is an educational film. I saw what happened. Yeah, it, it taught me a very important lesson. Eternity sucks. Especially an eternity spent being stuck doing the same thing over and over. What a tangent this was. Why did we even bring up uploads? I can't even remember. I, I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I do know. That, oh, uh, I remember. Straight, de- straight detective is in black and white and noir. In fact, uh, it's probably like cloudy and rainy over her all the time. That and then is everywhere why else, in, we're fine. In the show, there's an elder generation woman. That's grandma, and grandma is all in black and white always. Well, obviously, she was invented before color. Right. Okay, now we can move on from the mystery. Uh, okay, so so we go find straight woman and try to bother her. But she is, is she kind of like, because I imagine she was on her way out, or is she just like buried in in paperwork trying to work on, oh, does she have the whole, all the, the red strings connected? I think we should catch her just as she's slipping on her, like her detective hat, which causes her to go black and white. Oh, okay. I was going to say, do we catch her putting on her black and white makeup? Nope. She just puts on the hat and then it just, it just happens. And then, and then we continue to bother her. She's walking. This, this is a walking and talking scene. We continue to bother her as she's leading us to her little nook of the studio where she definitely has the red string thing going on. She's been detecting. Okay, good. And I think as we do a walking and talking scene. It should become very uh, clipped and mouthfully, and it should become an Aaron Sorkin West Wing moment. Does that mean we should be passing people in the hallway? Yeah, definitely. People we don't even know. Yeah, people we don't know who shouldn't be in the studio, and like, who are these people? There's we don't even have a secretary. Who was that? Yeah. Do Do you think? I think there should be one character. I think only Tucker notices that the people that were passing. He's kind of stopping to like point and point with his mouth open but then we have to move on to the next turn in the hallway if anybody is the correct character to do that it's probably tucker because somebody he's small enough somebody can actually just reach back grab his shirt collar and just pull him along so he can't actually hold anybody up or do we have to have the scene where one of those people passing through is like hey guys and we say hey passively and then you notice like hey wait a minute oh hey mark (laughs) wait a minute we don't know a mark but we know his name somehow. But yeah, we don't. There's no Mark here. Yeah, who's Mark? Turn around. He's already gone. That was weird. Oh, you had mentioned one of the victims being having like wings. There is a Batman's outfit. Unlike the DC superhero Batman, this outfit will actually let you fly in the sky. And it's it's Wiley e. Coyote in a green outfit with like wing uh, webbing. So somebody could have got fired on a rubber band with a wing we- wing suit. Oh, are we going to make some of these deaths kind of like poetic? Like like the person who died flying really, really badly wanted to become a pilot, but they washed out? Hmm, interesting. I guess it would. we would have to know the motivations of the killer a little bit. 
because that is sort of interesting. If this is sort of like a seven thing, but it's like an where, angel of where death. The, where the deaths fit the the attitudes or the behaviors of the victims. That That is a little bit cerebral for us, but we can definitely try to make it funny. Yes, I was, trying, I was trying to figure out what, I mean, if it was only a reference, but hmm. Nah, maybe maybe the killer is just applying, he's just projecting because Acme stuff doesn't make any sense. Why should, why should the motivations of the killer? Right, yeah, because I guess before... That's 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 the part of this villainy scale. The, the the delineating spectrum of villainy, that's what our villain is, is he is all the way on the maximum apex of villainy. He has no motivation besides villainy. He's just doing it to do it. No rhyme or reason. It's just crimes of convenience when he's got the Acme stuff ready to go. He is 100% villain with no redeeming qualities, no greater goals, no no real motivations that you could understand so will that actually be part of the conversation then is is we'll have to say is some maybe maybe we will suggest i'm trying to i'm because i'm trying to let my first thought was straight detective is trying to get to the motivations well what are the motivations the classic the classic thing but it would be better if straight detective is trying to explain to us why villains aren't the villain's motivations aren't always important because some villains have no motivation uh, or motivations don't figure in and we're not understanding. And so that's when Strike Detective says, Plato, can you please explain this to them? And then we get, start going on our educational journey. Okay, so she she can't figure out what the motivation is. And then Plato helpfully chimes in that maybe there isn't one. Yeah, that could work. I was, I was trying to give her the, trying to give her the, uh, I guess, what's the word? to run point on it so that Plato wasn't mansplaining to her. Ah, I see. Well, That's I mean, Plato's important. been Plato's been mansplaining to us this entire season. That's kind of his purpose. He's yeah. here to teach us lessons. He's our Miss Frizzle. However, he can definitely hand the reins over to straight woman because straight woman can just kind of insist that even if you can't figure it out, there's still a motivation somewhere. And technically, he does have one. His motivation is just to do bad stuff when he can get away with it. But that would work so well just for the scripts to go cleanly rather than me trying to PC it up. It would be very clean for her to have everything connected with red strings and say, I've got everything mapped out. The only thing I can't figure out is his motivation. And that's when Plato emerges and says, ah, oh, well, maybe that's not what you should be looking at. And we're like, what? Does, does, a, does a rabid dog have a motivation? Is this he's emerging from the shadows? Plato? No, I think I think he should actually have been sitting in like a chair in this area and has just been there the whole time. But the camera, he, nobody notices till the camera pans to him. <laughs> I've been here literally the entire time. You have. Do you remember we did a red str a, the shoestring theory? With, yes, uh... we we had a we had a homeless eccentric who was actually completely correct, and he had a he had his his uh, detective string set up. I was just wondering if any of that would would play bringing over to this, but I don't know. It's just a minor detail. I mean, I have no problem with him being in the background somewhere. Oh, he comes in at the end and he grabs his 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 strings off the wall and he he like huffs, marches out in a huff. Thank you very much. I was actually thinking that he would show up and kind of inspect her red string setup and just kind of like shake his head at her and be like amateur. Oh, I like that. Yeah, amateur or or the other end of the spectrum. Like, ah, oh, excellent craftsmanship. Well, I guess I guess it would be nicer for him to say that it's uh, pretty good out of ten. But it's also actually funnier if he comes in and he's looking at if he if he's in a in a very uh, like uh, studious position. He's got his hands behind his back. He's admiring the work as though he's in a uh, or examining it. I should say as though he's in a in a museum. And then to turn away and just be like disgusted amateur. I mean, he he's focused his entire life on basically being good at that one thing. That's all he does with his time. If anybody is going to be deciding what is and isn't a, a slack job, it's going to be him. I mean, I could if if we wanted to do it as a right at the end and it fades out as straight detective is trying to uh, defend her work and explain why it's excellent and they're arguing with each other. 
that does leave it a bit more even because she gets a chance to defend it. They could both be wrong or right, whatever. Anyhow. Obviously, they're both wrong because Plato's right. Oh, of course. The fallback. Because that's how we've written him. So Plato says that we need to be considering that his motivation may not even be a factor. There may be no motivation at all. Are we going to... Because you kind of described it as a spectrum, right? Yeah. Hero, hero to villain is a spectrum, as it's understood narratively. Like you've got hero, anti-hero, anti-villain, and villain. And, and you've got little dots and nodes all around between those like primary archetypes. Now, should we paint this so that the killer isn't actually... So this is where you were, you were kind of saying, is, is he killing people? Is the death some sort of poetic uh, representation of how the person was? But I'm wondering if the... Because there's... Hmm. I, I'm trying to come up with motivations. That's interesting. Are we going to say that whoever this killer is isn't actually a villain and should be should represent um, what am I trying to say criteria of somewhere else on the spectrum? Oh well, if he's if he's out there murdering people for no good reason, then he's probably one hundred percent villain. I guess that's true. Pretty pretty hard to justify any other placement on that on that uh, you know anywhere on that sequence if. If you're just killing people for no reason, especially if you're using Acme. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So I was, I was just trying to figure out what, how the lesson is actually going to play out. I guess maybe. So if we know if, if, if we, I don't know if we even need the line, who is a villain, what is a villain, but if we're trying to rule out things that are not a villain, maybe if we can rule out enough things that are not villains, such as heroes, anti-heroes, anti-villains, then we can figure out who the villain is you know what i'm saying oh well we know it's not this person it's not this person it's not this person it must be somebody like this or are we going to accidentally discover it in the end we'll probably wind up having to trick or otherwise trap this character if they have no uh no real pattern then there's no way for us to predict what this murderer is going to do next so we're going to have to place a lot of traps and just kind of hope we get lucky but basically what what defines a real villain is the absence of redeeming qualities because an anti-villain does have redeeming qualities like marvel's thanos although he was still pretty stupid because population control is a temporary solution to a permanent problem you know energy and resources why don't you just make more resources but uh he had a, a goal that was technically humanitarian it was for sustainability right that's an anti-villain. He had a goal that was supposed to benefit the greater good at the cost of the greater good at, in his in practice, the way he went about it. But he had a goal. That makes him an anti-villain rather than a villain villain. So should our Roadrunner be Bill Cosby? <laughs> Bill Cosby is pretty close to being absent of any redeeming qualities as far as I'm concerned. So, especially our our hilarious cartoonized version of him who is just like a an ice cream truck predator right or because and, and he did say that he would be back so but at the same time he already he already actually is like legitimately guilty of a serial criminal activity so maybe i don't want to like pretend that he is also a killer and then kind of like distract from the fact that he's also a serial rapist so should we may actually make it a joke and should it be a tongue-in-cheek saying we should pick some other public figure and say that they are completely irredeemable or we immediately think as soon as we as soon as we think that maybe it's the total absence of redeemable qualities we immediately conclude that it must be bill cosby and we start tracking down his ice cream van we're going to we're going to capture him and we think we've saved the day but we're wrong. Oh, I like that. That's always good. Yeah, and then yeah. it's also a little bit of a twist. If if we're going to be the protagonists, we need to suffer setbacks. We need to be wrong. <laughs> it would also be very funny. I don't know. Never mind. It, I no, no, finish that thought. Come on. It would be funny if Bill Cosby's excuse his uh what's the word what is it called when some his alibi his alibi for why he couldn't have committed the murders was because he'd been doing all these other rapes. Oh wow, that's dark. But yes, that would I I have an alibi. Oh yeah, what is it? I was really busy 
sexually assaulting this person while they were unconscious. And I, I have it on video and uh, like date and time and everything. I'm trying cool. to figure out how to do it as a joke. So maybe he could say, I have an alibi. And we're like, what? And he pulls open his camera or not his camera, his uh, his iPhone or whatever. And he pulls it out and he we we don't even see it. We just hear the sa- multiple. He, he swipes through multiple videos of the sound of women snoring. Yeah, he's just like, here, I'm going to give you the pudding pop. And we're like, no, 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 put it away. <laughs> okay, we get it. Yeah, just no, 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 put it away. Uh, get it out of here. Take okay. your pudding pop and get the fuck out. And so do, is this where we actually, so is this where we go, oh, okay. Uh, he couldn't have committed the crime, but we kill Bill Cosby here anyways. <laughs> we, can't, we definitely can't let him go. We can't let him go. <laughs> we have, to, oh. Yeah, I guess now we've got, we're in a bit of a pickle because uh, I also don't want to advocate for the death penalty for, not even for ice cream truck predators. Hmm. So do we, do we do something? Do we do, oh, we do something. We give him tornado seeds or something. Like we give him an acne product that we found at one of the crime scenes. Oh, I think this is the perfect opportunity for us to use the wings and the uh, elastic. We just get rid of them. We just get rid of the same way as Hitler. We shoot him off into the horizon. Yeah, we get rid of him. <laughs> All right, that's it. You're going in on the Hitler list, Bill Cosby. And then do we have a, do we have a verbal like uh, acknowledgement of like, so we didn't kill him, right? And we're just like, I don't know. He's gone. Uh, I don't know. Do you have conclusive proof that we killed him? Me neither. I think that means that maybe he survived. If. And then we can wash our hands of like ethical responsibility of it and just move on. I can live with that. It's a, a Schrodinger's Cosby. Yeah, yeah. We only know if he's dead if we actually go and have a look. Do you want to go and have a look? Me neither. Okay, so that's solved. Okay, so that was a good twist. So he he revealed though. Should he? Ha- does he know? He knows that. Okay. Fuck. First, um, first, I'm kind of curious how we tracked him down and captured him. Because that's probably like a miniature adventure by itself that probably deserves to be considered. It does deserve to be considered. It would be funny if we just showed up. (laughs) We just knew where his ice cream truck was. Yeah, like like his ice cream truck has an address and we just went to it. I don't think so. Do we have to set up bait and then just like just like a woman who looks really vulnerable? Because that seems like a terrible thing to do. Or does, yeah, that's because we decided not to make that same similar kind of joke when we were baiting the uh, the uh, cops, the racist cops. Right. That's correct. And and we have Plato with us. He'd never let us get away with that. No. So I think maybe does Cosby do social media blasts with coordinates for where he's going to do his next pop up, <laughs> his pudding pop up? <laughs> pudding. Oh, man. See, on the other hand, he's probably a fugitive, so he probably doesn't want to be found. All we have to, but on the other hand, all we have to do is hold up like a couple of dollar bills and be like, oh, if only I had some ice cream. And then off in the distance, you hear the ice cream band song and here he comes because Cosby can't resist you. We know he can't resist you because he, that's been proven in the court of law. That is actually funny. Do we go out to the middle of nowhere? And to make it even more like dramatic and drastic. Absolutely. And we we just stand in the middle of a highway. It could even be one of the scenes from the the Roadrunner. We're out in like the Utah desert or whatever. And we're we're just standing by the side of the road going, I wish I had some ice cream. And we stand and we hold our hands to our ears. We cup our our cup our hands to our ears. I'm I'm actually I'm actually mimicking it right now. Um pantomiming, I should say. I can I can almost hear it in your enthusiasm and and, and it's silent for a little bit it, we can it's we just hear the the breeze and <laughs> just slowly it's a very long scene it's much like the the long walk down uh Chekhov's alley which oh, is now I a reference that. i loved that Chekhov's alley that was it's great. a it's a long drawn out silence as this as the the ice cream truck song slowly appears over the horizon and gets louder and louder and then is just suddenly there um the the ice cream truck cosby's in front of us i already have it in my head i can see the scene so somebody has to call out if only we had some ice cream 
and then you start counting your money and then yeah somebody else puts their hand to their ear and starts listening the camera needs to zoom out somehow we're in the new mexico desert uh, a tumbleweed goes by suddenly you start hearing this distant sound on the wind it's it's the ice cream van song. The camera zooms in as we make a comment to each other. It's working. It's working. Camera zooms out. He's already there. No, ti <laughs> yeah, no exactly. tires, no tires screeching, no movement. It's just there. And it has been probably since the camera zoomed in. Just a fast cut. Uh, since we are in the New Mexico desert, then do we have a, a Walter and Jesse RV anywhere? Oh, I absolutely. It should probably be in the distance and smoking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we hear shots, shots and backfires or whatever going on in the distance, and we're like, "Man, wonder what's going on over there." No, oh, we're we're even going to comment on it. Oh, what's going know. on over there? I I think it I might be know. funnier. I think it might be funnier if we make no comment to it at all. But it's definitely the RV, and it's definitely got smoke coming out of all the windows. It's similar to when we saw what's his nuts, uh, Peter Stormare. Uh, in the the Fargo cops in the in the just he was in the background oh, yeah. making <laughs> putting somebody's leg in the wood yeah. chipper. <laughs> uh, I love I love just like scenes like that. Blink and you'll miss it, but and nobody calls it out. Right, which is you know what I think that's the that it, it is it is the anti Family Guy. It's I mean it's a little bit Family Guy, but it's not leaning in, leaning in on it so hard. Yes, because instead of somebody being like, oh, you think that's bad. Remember that time, blah, 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 blah. And they actually call it out. That's not quite as funny as like somewhere in the background. There's just an Easter egg. Yeah, that's more fun. OK. Yeah, well, because then the call out is the entire joke of the scene. But in this case, the scene itself is a joke. And then it's just got like this little extra joke nugget in it. Right. It's like a peanut in your chocolate bar that wasn't supposed to have one. Or an onion ring in your French fry bucket. That's always a delight. Okay, so we made that was that was our that was our journey to Cosby. He journeyed to us. Do we have any more to add to that sequence? Well, he came to us, but if you recall, he's almost a super soldier. Yeah, I guess. Do, do, how can maybe we don't need to like catch him? Maybe we can just convince him to come with us. Maybe we promise to buy all of his ice cream, but all of the rest of our money that we need is back at our studio. Oh, interesting. By the way, Bill Cosby, could you give us a lift back to our studio? Back to our studio or back to are we we are trying to lure him into our van? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, where did we get a van? Never mind. We we uh, we have it from the people who abducted us before. It's the white van that broke through our wall. Yeah, we have it now. We got the van, we got the, the face blur, we just don't have Joshua. No, he'll have his own episode someday. We'll go save him Private Joshua. And then later we're going to save him from space because he's now Matt Damon. Oh, yeah. The U.S. government has spent so much money rescuing Matt Damon. And the South African? I don't know. I just watched Elysium recently and I can't even remember what the details were. I think they were in... No, they were in South America. Okay, okay, so... We actually managed to bamboozle Bill Cosby. We promised that all the money that we that we need to buy all of his ice cream is in this van. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <so> <laughs> and as soon as he gets in, we shut the door and slam on the gas. And we hear just like a, a, a tumble and a bonk inside because we didn't wait for him to get seated. There are no chairs in there. Do we have like a big obvious like spray painted like money van on the side of our van? Maybe it's just a dollar sign or <laughs> yeah. or like it's a like a shitty picture of a bag of money, like a burlap sack with a dollar sign on it. And a thumbs up. And, and a thumbs up, maybe a plus sign. OK, I'm <laughs> I'm enjoying that little thing too much. The abduction, the, the the luring into the van. Okay, so we squeal off with... Yeah, well, uh, serves him right. Turn around is fair play. So we haul ass back to the studio, yes. In our van. I'm glad actually having the van there makes it sense because we needed to get out there somehow. So we bring him back to the studio. Does Straight Woman then do... Does she actually have a bit of a uh, uh, a lamp, a lamp light, like not necessarily torture, but uh, interrogation scene then? Oh, absolutely. She needs to dominate an interrogation scene. And I think she needs to 
we we need to tick off a few interrogation trope boxes while she does it. Noir stuff specifically. She needs to threaten to hit him with a phone book. The, uh, does that turn into a joke about not having a phone book? Yeah, nobody has a phone book anymore. Give me a phone book. Uh, we don't. Have I think one. It, I think it would be super funny if we had rotary phones, but no phone books. Oh yeah, just like anachronisms, just all over the place. Like we have old-fashioned rear projection television sets that are f- big and fat. We've got smartphones. We've got really old-fashioned creeper vans. We've got time machines. We've got rotary phones. <laughs> yeah. We have no phone books. We open up the phone book app and slap them with the phone book or with the uh, smartphone. But since modern smartphones are so fragile, it breaks and he feels fine. <laughs> yeah, that's actually funny. So somebody has to go find an old fashioned Nokia, which actually causes him fear. He gets the fear sweats and his eyes literally say fear. Oh, yeah, that's because what, that's what because gets him the to old, talk. The old fashioned Nokia, those things are indestructible. He will be a a pile of strawberry jelly before that thing gets a crack. Okay, fine. I'll talk. I'll talk. I'll talk. It's, uh, it's, I'm, hmm. Uh, no, he doesn't have a partner. I was going to say, I, w- I wanted to do that trope from Westerns where, um, they say, like, just show us where on the map. And then they d- fucking destroy that guy. And then they get the next guy and say, show us where on the map. And he immediately points. We're going to need to bring that in somewhere else. Somebody who has a partner. Somebody. But what this achieves is getting him to finally show us proof that he's not the Acme killer, which is when he's like, he pulls out his video where he, all you hear is like, I'm going to give you the pudding pop. And we're like, no, nope, no, shut it down. Just stop. Put it away. Get the hell out of here. And then we rig him up at the elastic. Do you, do you hear snoring and lullaby music in the back of those videos? So long as we can mix that all together, but the the pudding pop line is still at the top because yeah i think i think that's the most important and then we all get to enjoy the the catharsis together of firing him out of a window almost at the speed of sound by a big oh a big uh, elastic that is from acme so do we cut immediately from no no turn it off and then maybe maybe a comment of like i can't stomach this and then immediately cut to him flying through the window to the rubber, rubber band or do we we go through the process of like him whining and complaining as we dress him up in the wingsuit oh no i think i think we can go straight from no shut that down get that out of here you have to you have to leave and then it's an immediate smash cut to him in like some kind of special chair with the elastic around him and like a, a draw bar that's holding the elastic and then one of us gets to be in like a black hood and you pull the lever Perfect. there he goes and then that's that's our opportunity to take some level of justice against him, just like uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Perfect. And he's still potentially out there. I mean, we could always run into him, run into him again. Oh, yeah. No, no body, no death. So now we know that it wasn't him. Did he have any sort of clue on him? Did we learn anything? Did, does he, did, yeah. did that interrogation give Plato any ammunition that he could inject into the lesson of where to go next well plato is certainly going to give us a brief lecture about how bill cosby while his motivations were deplorable he certainly had them right yeah he had an mo he had a motivation he he had a pattern of behavior that's always what gets them caught too is the pattern i appreciate your boy's attempt to latch on to the gnome or to onto the uh the irredeemable thing, but you need to keep in mind that we were also talking about having no motivation. You're looking for somebody who has no motivation. Which causes us to immediately conclude that we might be the Acme killers. <laughs> that works. Because Wait, just I've like never had any motivation. Yeah, me neither. Just like everybody always told us, we've got no ambition. Maybe we're the killer. Oh, do you and I immediately start accusing each other? Wait, you've never had any motivation. <laughs> that's a good way <laughs> that's a good way to take over the scene immediately and because i've always said that you and i should have a a uh what is it a randall and dante moment uh but we've never had any real reason to have any like prolonged conflict so if this this could be very brief this could be just immediately solved with plato pointing something out obvious or straight detective 
I think that the both of them are going to stand back with their arms crossed and watch for a few minutes as we go about doing this, though. It's probably very cathartic for both of them after dealing with us to kind of watch us direct all of this vitriol to each other. That is that is funny. Oh, straight to tech is kind of like, is this part of the lesson? And he's like, no, it's just entertainment for me. <laughs> Plato's about to step forward and straight woman stops him with a hand on his chest. Don't ruin this for me. I need this. <laughs> just let it happen. Oh, maybe that sounds awful. This this is nice. Just 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 please don't stop them yet. Just just a few more minutes. Just let me have this. So do we solve our problem? Uh, I think that we continue pointing fingers at each other for a little while. Eventually that breaks down into ad hominem as it often does. So we start calling each other names. Eventually, we're mad at each other for the names we've called each other. We've forgotten entirely about the Acme Killer thing. We're no longer, that's no longer the point of contention. Now we're just like upset about the mean names we're calling each other. So we start pushing each other. And since Tucker is much smaller than Todd, one push is all it takes for him to kind of tumbleweed down the hallway and down a flight of stairs. And then the fight's over. Oh, yeah. Is, is it because I'm having big brother syndrome? I've pushed my brother over several times and then immediately felt bad about it. Am I immediately like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm apologizing to straight woman or whoever else. I don't know. Yes. In fact, you're probably trying to chase me as I tumble, but you're just a, a hair or two slow. So down, down I go. And of course, I'll be at the bottom of the stairs, like dusting myself off. Or maybe I've got X's for eyes and you have to pick me up and dust me off and be like, look, 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 it's okay. It's okay. You're fine. Look, you know, big brother style. Yeah. Carry you back up the stairs with the violin music. I think you're dead. He's he's fine, right? He's fine. You're fine. I look at him. He's fine. Trying. We give you Acme Be Alive Again sauce. <laughs> just just some act, just a bottle of fine. You're fine. A bottle of fine, yeah. All better now. Uh, I mean, uh, the the other option that I was sort of imagining for it was to go back to Firefly. There's that scene when I think it's I can't out of gas or whatever when Mal is yelling at Wash about what they need to do, and Wash is yelling at him about well, if I had done or whatever. And it's that that scene of like, well, then fine, maybe I will. They're they are they're in the heat of the moment, so they're yelling angrily, but they're actually having a progressive conversation. They're in agreement, but the tensions are so high that they're yelling anyway. Yeah, right. I think that that is the other way for it to kind of like end, or maybe that is what leads to the well, push. Well, I think yeah, <laughs> too much enthusiasm in your agreement. Either that, or Fine. we either that, or we save that for a later scene where it looks like we're going to have a repeat of the breakdown, but we just agree with each other angrily. Oh, that's better. So, yeah, because then that ha that ha that's a moment for for Plato and uh, what's her name? I almost straight called her woman. <laughs> <laughs> Just for them to kind of like be like woman. to kind of like nudge each other and be like, oh, great time for a cigarette break. Or I don't know, maybe they roll their eyes. They're they're sick of it. And then we solve it immediately. Actually, that's better. Yeah. If they're they're excited, be like, oh, time for us to sit back and have a cigarette break. And then we immediately solve the conflict by our don't have a chance. They're annoyed. Yeah. Like they, they hear us continue to yell, so they think everything is progress, you know, proceeding as planned. But then the yelling is over because we're done, we're good. And maybe that can be in like the final. That can actually be, yeah, that's a good moment when we have the sort of Scooby Doo moment where we've discovered the villain and we've got the villain sat down, having the kind of like, ah, oh, I would have done it if it weren't for you meddling kids or whatever. As we're trying to accuse the villain, we can start arguing, and that's when they're like, oh, cool, break moment, and then we solve solve it immediately. So so we'll tuck that one ahead instead yeah. of behind or away. Ahead. So yeah, it's, it's tucked. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so you pick me up, dust me off, give me a, a, let's say, half a bottle of fine, save some for later, waste not, want not. Oh, there is an Acme Instant Awakener. That's slightly less funny than a bottle of fine. That's how funny. do you how do you feel? Fine, I guess. <laughs> I guess yeah. There's nothing stopping us from inventing Acme products. Well, no, of course not. I uh, just assume that Acme has every product, and if you if if you can imagine something that they don't have, they'll make it. Okay, so where do we go from here?
well, you're going to have to put me down. And then Plato's going to have to be like, as I was saying, and then he's going to have to give us some kind of a little bit of exposition as to, you know, how you might bait a wild animal who is a little bit unpredictable. Well, are we going to end up, is it, does it turn into something sort of sci-fi-ish? What am I, or I guess fantasy sci-fi uh you know you know when the protagonist is fighting against something that is able to predict time and so oh didn't they do it in like jumper or whatever that trash was um where they had to act unpredictably so that the person who could see into the future wouldn't know where they would be showing up do we use some sort of technology that allows it like a random a random uh, some sort of rng thing oh so you want us to implement chaos theory, basically, so that we actually are basically on the same wavelength as a roadrunner, and the proposal there is that we'll inevitably cross paths. Yeah, kind of like that. So we need to channel his energy. That is probably a, a final act thing where we figure that out. I think first we should try to bait him and fail. Okay, so failing one more time. Oh, is this our two, three? Yeah. Okay. You know, we love that. It's a classic. So then maybe we should have... So Bill Cosby was not irredeemable. He was a villain. He had motivations. He, But he was yeah, on a different he, part of the spectrum. He, he was definitely, if not completely irredeemable, he was very close to it. But he wasn't... Because there, there's like a little special nook right at the end of the villain thing where it's basically just acting purely on vile impulse with like no real concern or consideration, even for self, really. So, but, uh, so, so just should the next person that we accidentally bait be an anti hero then or just somewhere else on the spectrum? That is a good question. I hadn't considered that, uh, not only do we not catch the Roadrunner, but we catch the wrong person again. I hadn't considered that we could catch another wrong person. Yeah, th I feel like another wrong person would be better for the educational formula if we're going to do a little bit of archetypes. Maybe it's not. Yeah, maybe it's a hero. We accidentally catch a hero. Oh, well, if we're going to accidentally catch a hero, we're going to catch our Fargo cops. Our trap seems an awful lot like a Roadrunner thing, which means they're on the trail. Oh, do we uh, in in attempting to catch an, a villain with mo no motivation? Do we actually accidentally catch a hero with no motivation? The the Fargo cops don't solve crimes because they are motivated to. They are just simply compelled by nature. That is an excellent uh, observation. They don't have any motivation, do they? They they just want to be polite and eventually catch the bad guy. But it, you know, if it happens, that's great. Yeah, it's not conscious. They just, it's just what they do. It's instinct. Or is it driven? I like the idea that it's driven by politeness, but the politeness is still isn't a conscious motivation. It's just innate. Yeah, they're very Canadian in that way. It's just an innate property. It's inalienable to them. They don't think about it. It's it's not a motivation. It's just a property of their beings. I like that a lot, actually. And maybe they are the sort of superpower that we are able to... Uh, um, harness i guess that that brings us in contact because because they are not motivated by anything they are just drawn to crime to solve or whatever they're drawn to, to that's, convicts that's actually perfect because it makes them in basically total opposition to the roadrunner in terms of their their kind of placement on the hero spectrum they're they're unmotivated good and the the roadrunner's unmotivated evil right and OK, so one more thing that we actually have to come to. Do we still like the idea that the Wiley e. Coyote has been this like James Bond character or whatever? Wiley e. Coyote is the adopted moniker of several investigators who have been on the Roadrunner's trail. Are we going to run into that person and he's going to be like, like humiliated and frustrated that the Fargo cops solved it just accidentally? Yeah, I think I think we need to meet that that person now. I think that. Uh... This trap that we lay, it's actually very acme. It it needs to seem like the work of the roadrunner. Oh, do we get which the we which which we assume is the kind of thing that will draw the roadrunner out because like calls to like, doesn't it? Right. I was gonna say, do we consult Wiley e. Coyote for how to lay the trap? 
No, I was thinking that he also turns up to the trap. We don't just catch the Fargo cops. We are ourselves caught by Wiley Coyote. Oh, that makes sense. So we lay a trap for the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote is drawn to it or finds it and thinks that it is Roadrunner. And so he catches us. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. We are foiled by our own trap. I like that. The, we catch the Fargo cops. They're in the trap. But as we show up to check the trap, Wiley Coyote shows up and catches us. And he's and he's like bewildered. He's like, I can't believe it. I finally caught you, you motherfucker. That is pretty much exactly his energy. And the, but the only reason that he caught us is because we're not Roadrunner. Yeah, but for a minute, we were channeling that Roadrunner energy, which we need to figure out how to refine using the Fargo cops. Because we were we were still motivated. We had a motivation. We wanted to catch him, but we managed to we managed to do it in a roadrunner enough way that this professional who's been hunting the roadrunner thought for sure that it was us. Okay. So somehow the Fargo cops will have to help us in convincing Wiley Coyote that we're not the roadrunner. Oh, one second, I got a weird. Oh, never mind. Um. Yeah. So the Fargo cops have to convince Wiley Coyote that we're not the roadrunner. They have they have to help us because they're 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 cops. They're very polite and very honest. So they're immediately more trustworthy than we are, especially because they're in the trap. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Oh, does maybe Wiley Coyote pull them aside? Because we're saying that he's an investigator, right? Is he an authority? He's like, a, is he police? Uh, no, he won't be police. He'll be like some kind of vigilante. But he he either has uh, like a private investigator license of some kind or he has professional investigator experience probably used to be a detective so would it be kind of a thing where he he does he respects the fargo cops though he doesn't trust us he's all squinty eyes and whatnot he's like i'll be over here talking to the authority the heroes the heroes not only are they more trustworthy to him because they're police but also they're in the trap which means they're not the ones who said it right which which automatically gives them more credibility in this situation than we have for sure and it's also good if he calls them heroes, since we're trying to say these are heroes, and that's why they're that's why we introduce them to the storyline. Naturally, beautiful. We're just gonna we're just gonna shoehorn that right in. We don't do subtlety. Subtlety is for amateurs. We throw narrative bricks. And so now I'm trying to imagine what would the conversation be between our our do gooding heroes and our wily coyote character. I had a joke from wily coyote because we uh, about. Yip E Coyote. I don't remember if it was ever funny enough for us to do anything with because it 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 rings a small bell, but not much. It's uh, it was it was when it was going to be because we said it was a lineage when we were saying Wiley Coyote was several investigators over a period of time. One of them right. was a line, and so Wiley Coyote's cousin was like Yip E Coyote, and it was going to be some sort of motherfucker, John. I, I I remember now. It was it was Wiley Coyote's mentor because there's just a line of them. This this duty has been passed down from, you know, it's it's been like the rule of two with the Sith in in Star Wars. It's been master and apprentice, and they just keep passing it down as as the master dies. So maybe just to shoehorn it in as a little joke, then when he pulls the Fargo cops aside and is like, "Listen, fellas," he whips out like a a a, a wallet with an eight by ten or not an eight by ten. That's a big one, a little wallet sized three by four or whatever. Uh, he's got a portrait, a black and white or a sepia portrait of another coyote um, who is maybe dressed like John McClane, and he says, "My mentor, Yippee Coyote." told me whatever 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 and that's why i'm gonna trust you on whatever you say kind of thing either that or once he catches us he has a moment of silence when he where he talks to this picture because he's like i finally found them you can rest now oh i like that yippee coyote and then i guess someone in the background has to show up motherfucker oh that's interesting if if he says to the sign or to the, not to the sign, but to the photo. He's like, this is for you, yippee coyote. And then one of us is like, motherfucker, why are we in a trap? Like coming <laughs> from another line. Somebody stubs their toe on the trap. <laughs> motherfucker, what's the matter? I just stubbed my toe. Don't worry about it. 
Okay. And so the Fargo cops, how is there anything specific? Is there anything clever that they could that they would say to 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 excuse us? Or are they just magical? Yeah. They are just so polite and innocent and unassuming that it probably does not take them uh, uh, given chase the given chase um what are the what's the word? I, I I remember that. In this case, it would be like, so what did you say you were looking for? You said you were hunting a road runner, right? Right. So we're out here. Do you see a road? I don't think so. Do you see anybody running? Well, I think I solved your case there, bud. <laughs> wow, that's the worst. <laughs> uh, if Wiley Coyote falls for that, then I don't have any pity for him or anybody else in his line. <laughs> they all get exactly what's coming to them. Does he does he go along with it at first? Like, no, I guess you're right. Wait a minute. No, I'm not taking that. Does not. And that's not what Roadrunner means or something like that. And they're like, OK, well, I guess, well, a Roadrunner is a bird, right? I don't see any beaks or feathers. Now, that part is true. He's definitely seen the Roadrunner before. He knows that the, that he knows that that guy has a beak and feathers and then he runs fast, probably tells Todd to go for a jog and. Tucker make or Todd makes it like twenty steps before he's tired. Oh, that could be one. Yeah, they they have us do. That's actually funny because it's similar to a uh, a roadside like drunk under the or driving under the influence test. We could have exactly. a little are you a roadrunner test? Exactly. Yeah, even if they let in with it, we're like okay, so have you ever seen this roadrunner? Could you describe him? And he describes us, and they're kind of looking at him as he describes a bird, and then they're looking at us, going like, I don't see it, bud. First. I do have to ask why the Fargo cops are already immediately convinced that we're innocent despite being in our trap. Oh, actually, yeah. Do they do, do they team up? They're actually on Wiley Coyote's side and they're not trying to defend us, but they're curious and they want to see, well, are is are these roadrunners then? Yeah, I suppose they're they're just as curious why they're in the trap as to uh, as Wiley Coyote is why we trapped them in the first place. So they're going to ask us questions, too. And we're in a trap as well. Like, Wiley Coyote has this in, like, a... He dropped... And, it's, of course, it's Acme brand, because he's Wiley Coyote. He dropped one of those cages out of the air on us on the ground. Right, okay. And so we immediately... We think that the Fargo cops are going to be on our side because we know them. But they got to... They're like, wait, hold on there, buds. Fellas, we gotta, we've got an obligation to the law here. To justice. To justice, yeah. Don't you know? Lady Justice, the, they roll a tear in the eye. Oh, yeah, just the the level of reverence for Lady Justice. Yeah, hats on heart and everything. So they're going to inquire with us as to what, they were, what we were doing, and it, we'll answer honestly. We were setting a trap for the Roadrunner. This is his kind of thing. We figured he would show up. The, this probably immediately convinces the Fargo cops, who give us the benefit of the doubt because they do that for everybody, but it doesn't convince Wiley Coyote, which is then when the cops turn to our side and thus assist us in convincing him that we're innocent. And thus proceeds the, can you describe this roadrunner to me? But before that, even just as a just to sew in an extra joke, as they're asking us, as the the Fargo cops are like, "You've got some explaining to do. What have you two been up to?" We go, "Well, we were watching cartoons, and then the news came on, and then we were trying to talk to." We do the whole explanation, and they're like, "No, no, oh, no. oh, I like that." And they have to keep, the, no, 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 speed it up, move, move ahead, move ahead. We jump too far ahead. Well, yeah, because we've been to the future. <laughs> we have been to the future. So we're like, "Well, there's this town." <laughs> what yeah everything is divided by ideology i think you're moving too far ahead there bud and cody's never seen caddyshack cody's never seen caddyshack too that's right okay um yes and then so we are fine so we do our t we do a roadrunner test we're obviously not roadrunners yeah uh we can't even run down the block we're out of shape we do awful meep meeps. Oh yeah, it comes out as like meep morp. Yeah, these two can't even meep meep. Okay, oh, we need a third test. Oh, a third of uh, the Roadrunner test. There was running, there was meep meeping. I guess, do we try to run through a tunnel? The Wily e. Coyote paints on a tunnel and we can't run through it. Ouch. 
I, I'm, I'll do it, and then I'm going to need the other half of that bottle of fine. <laughs> Good thing we saved this. And as you can see, these boys don't have any feathers. They don't have beaks. And that means that they have to be innocent, don't you know? I'd say quite conclusively. Well, case seems cut and dry there, eh, bud? Well, now we need to actually find the Roadrunner. And it turns out we've been looking for him. We could actually use your help. And now we we have an Asa Avengers Assemble moment because now we've got a bunch of people coming together to help. That's true. Hooray! Do we all go to a skyscraper to plan on the top floor? Uh, I don't know if we can go to a skyscraper, but I'm sure Wiley e. Coyote has like a little base somewhere. And I bet he also has his little red string diorama. Oh, and straight detectives like, nice work. And the, the bum's like, Pff. Where does he keep coming from? <laughs> He's just always around. He's just with us now. I bet you if the camera ever pans out far enough and turns back behind us, there's the, like a small entourage of side characters following us around, just waiting for a moment. <laughs> like uh, Forrest Gump's followers. Exactly like them. His entourage. Now I am curious. I like the idea that Wiley e. Coyote has like a, a base, though. Is it well, a, like a lair? He's, he's a vigilante. He needs to have a lair. But it can't be a bat cave. It needs to be a coyote cave. Right. And he needs to have a really ugly car that he calls the Coyote Mobile. It's just a like an old puce station wagon. With like the wood paneling on the doors? Exactly. Or like a gremlin or whatever, a pacer. It's got the wood the wood paneling on the doors, and it's got a racing stripe, and like none of it is appropriate or fits. Oh, is it the PT Cruiser with the wood paneling and all of that? Sure, so long as it's puce. Yeah, it's just extra lame. Puce is the ugliest color that's ever been conceived by mortal minds. I agree. Pink and brown. Those two colors should not meet. They came up with a good name for it, too. Yeah, just saying it kind of makes me want to vomit in my mouth a little. Puce. It's, 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 like, a, it's like an automatopoeia. It's a pukey sound. Puce. A pukey, pissy sound, yeah. <laughs> this is disgusting. <laughs> Wait until I add the sound effects. Yeah, but no matter how bad it is, it's still not as bad as puce. No, <laughs> the sound effects is just me whispering puce in a in a in a in a reverb. Yeah, <laughs> puce. Echo, echo, echo. Disgusting. Oh, okay. We're at the all lair. right, all right. Yeah, we're at the layer. We're at the layer. Uh, now that we have everybody assembled, everybody actually starts comparing their notes on this uh, red string diorama. So strings start being moved around. Uh, a couple of things get adjusted and everybody takes a, like a, a step back away from it with a look on their faces. Like the camera, the camera can't see the diorama right now. It just sees the characters. They all take a step back away from it. They have a look on their faces as if they've just like had some kind of epiphany. Like they're working together as like created some kind of a pattern where everybody thought there wasn't one, but it turns back around and it's just a mess and there's nothing Oh, I thought the string was going to spell out a weird name or something like that. Either the name of the person or like a bad word. But it's just the, it's just an explosion. <laughs> it spells pews. <laughs> oh, yeah. We all look at it in disgust. Oh, we're all shocked. And <laughs> I mean, it just says pews. Uh, yeah, one of us is one of us goes green in the face and throws up into a trash can. <laughs> <laughs> what could it be? And it, it spells pews. Oh, I've never seen something so sickening. It's not even the color, it's just the word spelled, but it's bad enough. And it, Wiley Coyote is looking at us as we're all having these reactions, and he's like, I don't get it. Yeah, like, you, you have to listen to the it. podcast. Of course, <laughs> of course Wiley Coyote wouldn't get it. Uh, uh, it's the official stance of the, the Tucker and Todd cast that Puce is a war crime. <laughs> it is the worst word. Actually, that will have maybe that will end up being a callback in the future. Then the word puce somehow leads to a war. Oh, I like that. And then eventually we have to start bleeping puce. <laughs> That's fun too. Yeah. Or when we bleep another word, we just bleep it with puce. But I can't think of a single word that would be worse. Worse than puce. Ugh. Nope. Nothing. Okay. So we decide that we're getting nowhere. So out of so basically Plato is going to have to point out or no no this is straight woman's opportunity to point out that it's the lack of motivation the lack that creates like no predictable pattern of behavior which is something that she's noticed 
in our Fargo cops. We got close to, you know, mimicking the Roadrunner's behavior when we caught everybody in the same trap. Like everybody came together. That's how close we were. What we need to get all the way is these Fargo cops and their their lack of motivation energy. They're like a dousing rod for crime. Exactly. So all we got to do is kind of use them to find the Roadrunner. <laughs> we actually hold them out. We we hold their legs in a V and they stick out straight in front of us like a dousing rod. I I I I think Wiley Coyote and Todd can each hold the leg of one of the Far Fargo cops and just kind of hold him up and he goes Brong! points <laughs> off. He's like pointing north north northeast or something. It works, but like we just find a pickpocket. Oh, so it demonstrates proof of concept. Yes, but we have to figure out a way to kind of tune it into what we need. And that's so, some some kind of silly wizardry involving Acme products will do it. Oh, as like an Acme, Acme signal booster or whatever? I think that's the best idea that I never would have thought of. Just like, they, a, like a shitty Wi-Fi booster from Acme. They, they, they wrap tinfoil on his head? Oh yeah, it's just it's just tinfoil with like a broken off car antenna sticking out the top of it. But since it's Acme and everybody thinks it works, it works. Yeah, they call it, they call it Acme signal signal booster. Because isn't that isn't that isn't that how you would boost like old bunny ears back in the day? You would just extend the antenna. Yeah, pretty much. It it works like that. Okay, so that works. <laughs> yes, and and that that will allow us to to track down the Roadrunner now. We never decided who the Roadrunner would be. No, we did not. And maybe he should get away once we've solved everything. Either that or he he escapes after he's unmasked. In which case, we either have a new villain or it turns out to have always been Matthew McConaughey. Oh. But I mean, he's already just like the hive mind guy and this isn't very hive mindy at all. So it's like a totally random side gig. Yeah, he also I feel like he actually has like a lot of motivation. Yeah, he does. What what we're dealing with here has to be like one of the writers from the man show. Oh, actually, that would be funny. If, <laughs> would, would it make sense to make it Joe Rogan or we already have a Joe Rogan thing that I do want to come back to with someday? Yeah, we'll save Joe Rogan for the right time. I kind of like, yeah, the man show. I was just thinking of something that had bad writing which was clearly indicative of a lack of motivation on the team or or should, i mean in that case should sorry it be adam Seth mcfarlane Ooh, that is pretty apt since we've been playing around with cartoon tropes and family guy cutaways and all sorts of things to make him the zero motivation having random serial killer well i'm sorry seth but you just lost the lottery Yep, I think I'm okay with it being Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen? Why not? I was saying Seth McFarland. No, I want Seth Rogen now. <laughs> what did he ever do? <laughs> That's exactly why I want him. He he is better at making fun of himself than probably any of these people. Oh, and in that case, he's also sort of unassuming. You would, yeah. You would at least expect Seth Rogen to be a villain. Yeah, and in fact, if anything... He should just narrowly escape us by doing that, uh, the usual suspects kind of change where he kind of evades us and then changes out of his costume. And then we go running by and it's Seth Rogen. And we're like, hey, did you see a bird running by here? And he's like, nope, didn't see nothing. And as we're leaving, he goes, meep, meep. <laughs> or, or... I, I, I don't know. I just know that, that Zach and Miri have to pay. Oh, that's funny. I was trying to figure out a way for him to disappear in a puff of smoke. A puff of hot smoke, of course. <laughs> uh, it could just be like exhaust from Bill Cosby's van. I'm also trying to work in the Seth Rogen laugh. If he's like, laughing. That I would. I've been hearing his laugh in my head the entire time since I started thinking about him. Because that would be funny if his laugh became a villain laugh. And then some sort of magic occurred. He's laughing and then it turns into coughs. And as he coughs, smoke starts coming out of his mouth. And then he turns into the smoke and disappears. So he's a supernatural creature? <laughs> yeah. I 
I do think it would be kind of funny if it was a deliberate smokescreen from Bill Cosby's van because they've been in cahoots this whole time and Bill Cosby actually managed to keep that the lid on that. But I don't want him to reappear so soon after we've killed him. I also I also don't want to align Seth Rogen with Bill Cosby. Oh, right. I hadn't even thought of that. Right. At this moment, I don't care what happens to Seth Rogen, and that's wrong of me. <laughs> I'm I'm still thinking of him being a serial murderer. But I'm stuck on the laugh thing. Yeah, it's not very meepy, is it? Does the laugh start start morphing into meeps? Oh, is he walking away, as you're saying, doing the uh, the verbal kint thing? And he's he's walking away as Seth Rogen, and then the laugh he's laughing because he got away and then the laugh turns into a meep meep and then he's gone yeah that that was that was it he's uh he's got to be it's got to be like some kind of slick kind of costume change walk not only does he get out of the roadrunner costume but like he he is walking down he steals one person's sweater and leaves his behind and puts that on then he's like steals a scarf and a hat as he's walking down a street. And so he not only did he get out of that costume, but he's he's undergoing a disguise assembly as he walks and he's laughing as he does. And then he just meep meeps. Is there any chance that his legs start rotating like at a 90 degree, like rotating extremely fast the way the roadrunners do? And then the, the colors change maybe in the blur of the legs and become roadrunner legs? I don't know. I'm trying to figure out some... It's it's occurring it. to me that it's only funny if we don't know he's the Roadrunner until he goes meep meep, which means the Roadrunner needs to disappear without a trace and just leave the Roadrunner costume there. And we just run out to an empty street and there's just like a guy back there smoking against the building. Hmm. And we're like, did you see somebody go running by here? Be like, no. Like, it, it's only funny if... We have no real good reason to suspect that this person is a roadrunner. Because the meep meep is supposed to be the reveal. If it's not the reveal, it's not a joke. Right. Oh, so is that the way we're actually doing it? So you're saying that we never actually know? So Tucker and Todd catch the roadrunner. Because the way that I always saw this happening was that we catch the roadrunner and then pull his head off and there's Seth Rogen inside the costume. Is that not what is occurring now? Well... I have a feeling that the Roadrunner would be rather difficult to catch on account of being really fast and being able to run through, uh, you know, a highway that happens uh, to have been painted onto a brick wall. So does so the way that this go then is is the when the, the, the Fargo cops are doing the dousing run thing, they lead us to Seth Rogen and we're like, Seth Rogen? And he has a conversation with us explaining like, I don't know why you guys, like he actually is able to, um, smoke and mirrors us so that we leave and then as we're leaving we recognize some we do a bit it's the the same way that the cop and usual suspects notices the made-up names around the room or whatever we notice clues around seth rogan's apartment he's like ah oh, let me run out back and grab you with something or other he says he's gonna go get us something and then we notice clues around the room that that add up to him being the roadrunner but it's too late he's gone and all we hear is the meet me uh well, by the time by the time we've actually been dousing rod, by the time we've been dousing rod led to him, we already kind of know. So at that point, it's just going to be a chase. Like he's going to be like, "Hey, I'm just going to go and get something," and then boop, 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 boo, boo, boo. <laughs> that's the sound of his legs starting to turn, and he now he is doing the roadrunner stuff, but without being in his roadrunner costume. There's. There's there's a highway and a horizon painted onto the wall in his house. Oh. So he'll he'll answer the door holding something, probably a pizza, because I I want Tucker and Todd to have a pizza at the end of this. Okay. <laughs> and he'll be like, oh, yeah, sure, come on in. And, uh, oh, hey, can you hold this? And he tosses the pizza at us. And, and of course, it catches us by surprise, and it gives him the opportunity to get his legs turning so he can do his full Sonic and get out of there. And uh, he goes running for uh, like a back window. But a straight woman's already standing there. So he, she's a barrier. You cannot pass. So he's like, ah, ah, he looks to the door, looks to the window. Then he looks to the, the painting of a very conveniently placed highway that stretches on into the horizon. He runs into it. And Okay. And that's technology that we don't have. So we can't chase him. 
No, but yeah, he goes meep meep right before he does. That's kind of his blue skidoo. Yeah, yeah. And then there he goes. And and not only does he run into the portrait, but of course he runs along this painted on highway so fast and so hard that it lifts, you know, the way that the road actually peels off of the ground and floats for a oh, split yeah. second after he goes down it. Oh, interesting. Just it, it occurred to me, do we do all, do we do it as a little Blue's Clues nod where he is? Because I've been imagining sort of like a large mural or whatever on the wall. But if he has like a, a framed p- painting on the wall and looks at it and does me, 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 me. Yeah, I think, it it should, a- I think it should just be a framed painting so that we it's not super obvious. If it was a whole wall, so, like a, a full mural on the wall, that's sus. And actually, I don't like the Blues Clues song. If he looks at us and says, sorry, fellas, meep, meep, and then pew, shrugs. I, yeah, I think I think that'll be it. He can't get out the back door. So he's like, all right, no more playing fair. He's going to use the Roadrunner powers. And also, I think even though we were taken by surprise by the pizza, I do think we caught it perfectly. Oh, yeah. Uh, the During the throw, the box opens and the pizza flies up, but we're... We forget about him and become preoccupied with catching the pizza, like in the first Spider-Man film with Tobey Maguire. So it's just like, catches oh, perfectly the in the box. Yeah. So we still, the pizza's intact. And like, he's leave, he's left everybody in their dust. Tucker and Todd catch up to everybody else in the room eating pizza. I'd be like, did we get him? Yeah, we, we catch it. We high five. We're celebrating. That's all we care about. We got pizza. Free pizza. It's Tucker and Todd are gonna Tucker and Todd. And that is the reward. We're not even upset that he got away. Maybe, maybe, well, I mean, obviously Wiley Coyote is, but we can't be bothered. We can't be asked. We're, we're too distracted with like, sorry, what didn't hear you munch munch. I think Wiley Coyote would be half happy, half sad, because now he knows exactly who the Roadrunner killer is. Oh yeah, that's true. That's he knows, where he, he knows where he lives. He's, he's, he's figured it out. Like, the killer is still at large, but he's solved it. He has the answer. So he's actually quite overjoyed, yeah, I guess. Yeah, he I mean he didn't catch the bad guy, but he solved the crime, and there's tomorrow's another day to catch him. It reinvigorated him and brought some purpose to his life. And now Plato probably owes us a lecture and he's gonna start, and then Straight Woman is gonna shut it down because she thinks this is all stupid and it's time to go home. The bad guy got away. Bill Cosby isn't confirmed dead. This has been a wash. She, she, takes, <laughs> she takes off her hat and she becomes colorful again. And that is that is she's being a straight woman. Yeah, that's her job. She's yeah. she's here to tell us that we've all gotten carried away and nothing good came of this. Yeah. And and we'll be like, oh, excuse me, I got a pizza. And, and then we offer her a slice and she probably slaps it out of our hands. Do we do we bring back since we had tucked it? Do we bring back our uh, our critical bum and them having a conversation? Do we are we because we're still in? Wiley's. Actually, what what we tucked ahead was us having an argument. Oh right, and agreeing, and I think it's going to be an argument about what the best kind of pizza is. I think that makes sense. Yeah, it should occur more or less right now, and, and this it'll... is actually what we're going to fade out on. Yeah. But I think the agreement is going to come down to being the best kind of pizza is free. Oh, good idea. Oh, yeah, because we said that it would end with us shouting in agreement, but the tension is there. And but the agreement ends up being that the best kind of pizza is free. I like that. Yeah, my favorite flavor is free. You know what? You're right. Great. Fine. (laughs) Why are we yelling? I don't know. Awesome. So does Plato feel like he actually taught us anything? No, Plato probably agrees with straight women and that this is a wash, but we've we've gone narratively through at least a couple of archetypes. Not many, but a couple. Does is that actually one of the things she points at when she's talking about all of the things that didn't actually occur, or all the all the failures that took place, she points out you didn't learn them anything, and he try he takes one second to be like, That wait oh, Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh he's about to muster defense, but it there is no defense to muster. You're right. You're right. I guess we'll try again next week when we do a real villainous episode. Oh, right. So we had also said that next week is our limitless episode and we're going to become villains. So where was there anywhere in here 
that we want to fit in a little foreshadowing of us becoming villains? Or do we want to make a reference to mom? Or do we just bring it all in new next week? Oh, I see no reason not to do a bit of a, uh, like a, a post fade out kind of scene where maybe on a counter in the studio, our pill bottle is empty or something. And like somebody comes by to bring us a refill for our prescription, but can't get in or something occurs. Oh, never mind. I know exactly what happens. Seth Rogen kills the person who's supposed to be bringing us our pill refill. <laughs> Is that how the case ended up on Straight Detective's desk? Oh, so it actually occurred at the beginning instead of in a post credit scene? Well, maybe it will, the, it will be revealed. All we know is that the person who usually delivers our meds was killed by a serial killer. And then maybe at the end it's revealed that it was Seth Rogen. But I think it would be a good idea to early in this episode just have a little reference of like, hey, did you guys remember to take your pills before we leave? And we're like, yeah, yeah, L looks like you're running kind of low. And then uh, we can, I don't know. Craig, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Stan says to take our pills before we leave and says that they're getting a little low. And we're like, yeah, yeah, we'll take them fine. And then Craig says, I've already ordered their replacement. Okay. Like their, their prescription refill. It's in transit. It's on route. But I do think that Seth Rogen should actually, not as a roadrunner, but as Seth Rogen, moving really fast, still running away from us, kill right. this courier. Yeah, I like that. So it was set up in the beginning that we our refill is on the way, and then at the end post-credit sequence here, we show the pills on the way being deterred by, by um, Seth Rogen. Oh yeah, he absolutely wastes this courier. Okay, I like that. Like red mist. <laughs> yeah. And thus, we don't get our refill, and next week the, the consequences of not taking our pills will become realized. Beautiful. And I, I think that wraps that up with the exception of the scene of our savant bum kind of chastising or admonishing straight woman on her job with her little, her red string diorama. Yeah, I guess he might have had to, because now we're almost like we're packing too many scene transitions. It's like the end of the uh, Return of the King. With the nice <laughs> different endings. Yeah. Uh, he, or also yeah. the end of uh, AC Odyssey. Yeah, either either it has to find somewhere else to fit in instead of the end, or it, it needs to be cut. Yeah, I think it, it would work good in the beginning if he was there, but I'm also not sure why he would be there. That's just a little, it's just a little, fly, uh, what's it called, callback. There's, he doesn't have to reason, have a reason for being there. Yeah, uh, we can figure out where he might fit in, if he fits in at all, and he might be like just a, a like a background figment, like the the RV. Right, yeah. So it'll just be like arms folded, head shaking in disgust after a scene where we focus on the the string diorama. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, yeah, I believe that was all perfectly wrapped up. Yeah, I think I think that's been a cast. And I feel like this was also one of our really smooth, seamless ones where there was not a lot of dead air and everything pushed forward really nicely. Yeah, I don't think there was much um and, and on. I consider that a success. I consider it a success if we manage to fill in the time. Well, it has been a time. and I think It, that it means has been a time. It's been a time, and I think that means that you've been Tucker. You've been Todd. They've been an audience. And this has been a cast. And this is a saying goodnight, Craig. Good night, everybody else, too. Bye. Bye-bye. Brought me in right at the end there. Nice. Fuck Tucker, Tucker sucks. And fuck Tucker's friend, Todd.